Well, hello everybody and welcome to this first meeting of Sea Nature. This is an opportunity to get together to share our enthusiasm uh, for the natural environment around about us and particularly at this time when we're still under some of the, um, uh, the lockdown uh, procedures that the government uh, announced a few now months ago. Uh, but it's given us a great opportunity to explore our doorstep and to see the sorts of things that, uh, that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise have seen uh, because we were too busy going into Salford and, and traveling around doing our normal job. And um, this is a great opportunity to look at what we've seen, what we might be going to see in the, the next few weeks and to share um, our experiences. And this is going to be an interactive session. I'm hoping that everybody will join in uh, using their microphone, using their screens to share uh, the, the various um, experiences that they've had. So what are we going to look at today? Well, the first thing that I wanted to find out is just where people are and see what sort of a spread we've got uh, across the, the country as to who it is, uh, I've, uh, who was here. I've got a little quiz for us uh, to see, a little um, mystery photograph, see if we can identify the mystery photograph. And uh, then the wow, this is an opportunity for you to share uh, your experiences, your highlights of the last week or so. Um, one of the things that I've missed is going to visit one of my favourite birds and I've found a webcam which allows me to do that and I'm going to share that webcam with you under webcam of the week. Then we'll hear from our guest for the day, Dr. Mark Champion. Uh, uh, Mark works for the Lancashire Wildlife Trust, uh, but he has um, a great experience in, in particular species that he works with and he's going to share some of his experiences um, with us today. Um, a regular feature of the things that we've been doing during the teaching session is to look at some moths I know there are a number of people um, joining us today uh, that are keen on moths, so we'll have a, a five minutes or so uh, looking at, um, at those particular species. I have in front of me uh, the ones that I collected this morning, and we might have a look to see what's, what's in there. Uh, we've also got a little bit on here about uh, you should have been here yesterday. Um, these are the sort of things that you might have missed and that you'd like to share with others. Um, things that you picked up on the internet or things that uh, you know that's going to happen. Uh, then we've got the answer to the quiz and our plans for next week. So uh, where about are you all? I'm speaking to you from Cheshire, from the northern parts of Cheshire. Uh, where is everybody else? Would somebody like to uh, open their microphone and tell us where you are? So I've got a message here from Meg to say that she's in Surrey. Anybody else? Any Anywhere? I'm Steve, uh, Steve Gowan here and I'm in Fulton Sands, just north of Lancaster. So we go from Surrey, the most northern we've got is, is Lancaster so far. Uh, RG, I don't recognise RG. Who, who's RG? They're from Birmingham. Anybody else from anywhere? I think Fiona, where uh, Greg's in Cheltenham and Gloucestershire. We've got uh, Mark Chester. Yeah, this is Danny here. I'm, I'm sort of in a... Philip Phillips neck of the woods. I'm also in the Cheshire area. I'm in uh, Winsford, in sort Winsford. of halfway between Chester and Manchester. And uh, Rob's in North East Chess Cheshire. Uh, Robert Yell is in uh, centre of Manchester. He says. Uh, Steve's in Conwy. And I think Fiona. I think Fiona's somewhere in Norfolk. So we have quite a good spread of people today. Um, around about and um, sharing our experience. North Norfolk. 
Now, one of the things I'm able to do is to switch from one camera to another. And situated on the right hand side of my desk is this bowl of uh, green liquid taken from my pond. And inside there are some tadpoles swimming around, as you can see. And they've exhibited a particular behaviour, which I'm hoping we might capture uh, during this programme. If we do, we'll switch back to it. Now, one of the um, things that we've been looking at uh, during the teaching sessions is a little bit of a competition. It, it came about um, really with Meg uh, being down in Surrey and uh, those of us that were a little bit further north. And this was the sighting of Swifts. And I wonder, Meg, have you found any Swifts yet uh, down in Surrey? Um, yeah, we have had swifts and we've also finally had some swallows as well, which was very exciting at the time. Finally caught up with the north. And you've caught up with the north, which is uh, which is um, excellent news. I've um, called up on one of the applications here called Swift Mapper. And it shows us where the Swifts are around uh, Britain. So we're going to see if we can get down anywhere near Surrey and see Meg and see whether anybody else has seen Swifts down in Surrey. Am I heading in the right direction, Meg? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Whereabouts do I need to be going now from here? Directly, uh, please. What, around Guildford. That's basically sorry around Guildford 511 sightings 116 in Guildford itself uh, the yellow circles uh, these are nesting sites and the other sites are ones that have been seen as a screaming party uh, so clearly we've got um, swifts which have been seen down there it was uh, a little while before you seemed to catch up with the rest of us uh, but this is a fantastic site which is recording swifts all over britain if we come a little bit closer to where uh, we are and i know mark you're in wigan i wonder yeah. if any swifts have been seen in all around wigan. and indeed plenty have um, going a little bit further north uh, to Lancaster. Are you north of uh, Lancaster, uh, Steve? Yes. Yeah. So there's Lancaster. Tell me when to stop. That's it. That's it. Yeah, um, that's in the middle, more or less. Yeah. So and plenty of this, but little gaps in the middle there. And, yeah. Uh, so hope we can add another yellow next year. We've put some swift boxes up. <laughs> so um And this is our question. Um, anybody have any idea what this is? Want to go for this, Danny? I can hear some typing going on. Well, people are typing, yes. And he's had a test of the Fiona found the um, Swift mapper interesting and she thinks it's a tiger hawk moth. So we have one person thinking that it is a tiger hawk moth, another one thinking that it is an elephant hawk moth. 
and Steve oh, Garland has come for Elephant oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. Well, we will have to wait until the end to see whether you are correct. Um, now on to the WOW session. This is the opportunity for us to share some of the things that we've seen um, around about. And I found this from one of my colleagues and one of our colleagues in Salford. Uh, that uh, today's wildlife watching include a mallard rat battle by a stream. We don't know who won. Two smooth noobs and um, a bat swooping. Uh, this was just a note that he, he put in just yesterday. And I wonder uh, what are your highlights? What are your wow moments of the, the last week or so that um, you would like to share with people? Hi, Philip. Do you want to just talk? Yeah. Well, Ruth said that he's seen a barn owl foraging, which is um, an excellent sight. Yes. Um, whoever was saying, um, whoever was talking to me, just please talk. Well, Rob beat me there because I was going to say I didn't see it directly, but I do something where I am do not an old recording. Um, to record the birds that are migrating over the house. So while I'm sleeping, I'm still sort of making my coffee. And I got a brown owl last night, so I'm very excited, but Rob's beating me. <laughs> I think you actually obviously saw one. <laughs> and Fiona said that she's seen some young toads on the move out of their, their ponds and uh, away. And Mark has seen a red kite. Uh, do you want to tell us about that red kite and why it's particularly unusual, Mark? Um, well, it's the first one I've seen in Wigan Borough, so it was at um, Astley Moss, uh, one of uh, the Wildlife Trust reserves. Um, and this is the sort of, there have been a couple of odd rec records in the last couple of years, but this year um, there has been a pair or so knocking around the area we call the Great Manchester Wetlands, um, NIA. So they've been seen, um, well, as far down as uh, Cheshire, through Wollstone Eyes on the Mersey, and then um, in Wigan, um, and Wigan Flashes on Ashley's. But it's the first time I've actually caught up with one in the borough, so it was quite exciting for me. And I, it was either that red kite or one of the, that pair, uh, when I turned uh, to look out of my window a couple of weeks ago, and saw it coming almost directly towards uh, the, the room that I'm speaking to you from now. And I had that dilemma that many of us are caught with. Do I get the camera and take a photograph or do I continue looking through the binoculars? Um, I'm someone who continued looking through the binoculars rather than reaching for the camera. A great spotted woodpecker in a garden and a grass snake, a gravid gas, grass snake. Uh, that's um, uh, excellent stuff. Strange starling behaviour in the garden. Uh, do you want to say anything more, Steve, as to what that strange um, behaviour around the left box was or is? Well, yes, it's a, it's one of these things where staying at home maybe saw something we haven't done before. We had a pair of starlings raise a brood in the nest box, and they've obviously fledged. And then we looked out of the window the other day, and there were two or three families of fledged starlings, maybe about 20 birds, and they're all around this nest box, which we think is now empty, and each starling seemed to take a turn to fly down, put its head in, have a look around, and then go and perch, and they, they seem to work through the whole lot. I have absolutely no idea what was going on, and I don't think there's anything in the nest box, so I don't know, <laughs> but I wouldn't have noticed it if I'd been out somewhere. <laughs> Oh, Fiona has written, perhaps chicks about to fledge. There have been four protected by several adults doing the rounds here. What you just heard, Fiona, does that seem to tally with, with that suggestion? Or have you heard something there in Steve's description that might change your, your view on that? Just wait for Fiona to type. Um, no, but J 
Jamie's has, has had some lovely waders, Dunlin drink plovers, and perhaps a sandpiper at Hoy Lake at the high tide over the weekend. Um, so you got out a little bit from the centre of Chester. Uh, yeah, it was really good. Um, so you go to the RNLI station, um, and there were loads of poorly controlled dogs, um, which in the end meant that they weren't the birds weren't too scared of me. But if you, um, it's better in winter. But um, just go out maybe half an hour before an hour before a cracking high tide. Um, it can be fantastic. Trying to get your wellies stuck in the mud. It's good fun. Good. Right, we're going to move on to a, a webcam of the week. And uh, the first um, thing that uh, I'm going to ask you is, um, anybody know where the Isle of Burrow is? Uh, I didn't, and so I, I looked it up on a map, and this was the image that I received back. So anybody doing better than me? Any suggestions as to where the Isle of Burrow is? No, no. Islands, small islands off the Channel Islands. Oh, he's, uh, Mark is ahead of us because when I zoomed in a little bit, I zoomed out a little bit, I found that it's next to Alderney. Uh, absolutely right, Mark. And one of the things that I try to do every year is to go to see some puffins and here by the magic of uh, using a webcam uh, we can visit the puffins off the Isle of Burrow. You can see a little raft of them on the water there behind the gulf. Uh, so my ambition for the year is complete as far as puffins are concerned. So we move on uh, from uh, Puffins to uh, uh, Mark. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Mark, and I'm hoping that you will now be able to share your screen with us. Here we go. Interestingly, in the uh, Berkew, um video uh, clip there, you've got um, the bluebells and it's one of the few places in the world where bluebell is actually part of the cliff flora no. as opposed to woodland species you know there's there's the, i knew there was a reason why i'd invited you to come along today mark and and that's it these little bits of information that um that i certainly um wasn't aware of this is what makes our interest in uh in natural history such a fascination that we can all learn from each other and that um, I had never I didn't realize that bluebells could have been a coastal uh, species and I'd not noticed them there either over to you Mark right well um, so I, I've put together a sort of sample of um, our work in Wigan um, one of the things that particularly sort of famous for is the willow tit with 10 percent of the uk population potentially living within the borough the borough and its close environment uh, close sort of uh, other locations um it particularly does well here because we've got a lot of secondary growth of uh, willow trees and they're all now getting to a certain age having been uh, um occurring on post-industrial sites and you can imagine they were the sites were abandoned largely in the 70s and 80s so the trees are now quite thick dense but are beginning to sell thin and rot so it gives the uh, willow tip which has to make its own nest hole um in soft timber 
the ideal chance. So we're down now in this country where there's an endemic subspecies clutch many eye down to um, around about 3,000 pairs. The RSPB is doing a survey over the over these last years. Um, it was going to continue this year, but for obvious reasons, um, it's been put on hold until next um, to recalculate the number of of willow tits. But here's a here's a willow tit um, doing what they're doing, taking a little green um caterpillar geometric caterpillar to the nest um and uh, feeding its young inside the uh, the cavity um so quite a quite a nice um it's a lo local bird that one and that's what they look like again a local a local wigan willow tip um the there is a similar species, the marsh tip, but um, you can identify them by this sort of panel in the wing where you can see that sort of pale patch where the uh, primary is all, all uh, pale and the fact that it hasn't got a little white dot on the bill. So they're the, they're the kind of key ways of, of telling them. Um, they're also sort of chunky and thick necked because they have to have quite heavy muscular muscles there to allow them to knock holes into trees so one of our special birds um it's a real pity because this year there seems to be quite a lot around so it'd have been quite exciting to have done um the survey work but unfortunately uh, one of the things that got dropped um due to the covid was um non-essential surveying so it's had to wait um i've been sending in secondary records to uh the recorders so we'll we'll still have got some useful information about how they're doing so the other thing that i've been involved in at the moment is a reintroduction of this species so this is a large heath butterfly um and that one was the first one that had flown in greater manchester um in the last 150 years they uh, were lost in about 1850 when the railway allowed the bogs to be drained uh, to create uh new uh peat mining areas so they were then lost this one flew in greater manchester uh yesterday at 10 it was the first time one had flown so that's um really exciting um we collected them from wind marley moss um as females last year and they've been being reared from eggs um laid at chester zoo and we've collected the pupae and are now waiting for them to hatch and releasing them as they hatch so there there is um quite an exciting story and hopefully you've got enough to start uh, reintroduce uh, getting the population back um, onto the mosslands of greater manchester area um while we were there um exciting to see sundew um again one of the species that's benefited from the restoration by warrington council uh, lancashire wildlife trust uh, in partnership with natural england and so on so there's big partnership working on the Manchester mosses starting to get them back wet after they were drained variously for munitions factories peat winning um, and so on and uh, so it's again it's, it's kind of an exciting um, thing to see and only 20 years ago there was only one for Sundew in Greater Manchester now it occurs on five of the mosses so it's showing just how well the restorations can do uh also i, I i've been out um this was in chorley um looking at some of the meadows this is not growing in the meadows along the yarra valley so there's a, some survey work um looking at work um at improvements since some re-wetting work and habitat and slowing the flow work 
by the Environment Agency and Chorley Council. So some really quite nice um, habitat improvements on the back of um, work to um, use the river corridor for reconnecting to its floodplain. Um, so, um, and that was on the back of the Boxing Day floods of uh, three, four years ago. So, it, um, so using the natural landscape as part of the defence of the communities and then getting these multiple benefits. So, um, quite exciting. And there is the River Chore um, with sand erosion um, with St Martins using the banks. And you can see things like the coarse woody debris within the river, all of which is uh, helping to maintain the slowed flows. So there's some quite exciting things there. And it's also having the effect of improving the water quality because like many urban rivers, um, the Yarrow could be slightly better. Although by the standards of some of them, it has still has good runs of sea trout and the like. So, um, it's, it, it's not all bad. One of the other things, this is a great, uh, this is a uh, conservation introduction um, by Wigan Council and the Northwest Rare Plants Initiative um, with uh, the Wildlife Trust as a partner as well. This is green winged orchid and it was put on um, various sites at Wigan as there is only one site in the Northwest um, where it, it grows. So to spread the risk, um, it was put into some of the grasslands, uh, again, as flower for the first time in Greater Manchester and Lancashire, um, outside of its one stronghold uh, for the first time in many, many years. So again, exciting work. Uh, I put this one in because it's uh, again it shows why some of these urban conservation projects um, are interesting. This was um, Wigan last weekend, going on my exercise. Um, but famously, it's known that I have a bit of an interest in these things, and this is the hybrid between northern and southern marsh orchid, and. The, outside of one field in Hampshire, letters on a postcard as it were, why it occurs in Hampshire where um, it shouldn't, um, is the only place um, where the northern and southern marsh orchids meet and they're thus the only place in the world where you get these um, hybrids and you find them through Merseyside into sort of Wigan Bolton and uh, that sort of Greater Manchester area. And part of the reason that they do quite well, we think, is as well that a lot of the soils are relatively novel, weird post-industrial soils, and the hybrid also um, is really good at um, using these, whereas the two species um, are less good. Um, so, uh, quite an exciting thing, and it's part of what makes sort of biodiversity interesting is that, you know, you've got this one zone of hybridization, um, so a direct result of um, COVID and um, Wigan Council, for instance, having to spend money on other things is that they've now got a deliberate policy not to cut the verges. Um, so whilst I've been on my way to other uh, sites and so on doing the day job, I've been part of the monitoring team looking at just what's growing in the verges and um, hence that this doesn't have a load of really rare species or anything in it that I've managed to do because it's where I could park and do the monitoring but you can see without cutting the verges in Wigan and this is the East Lanks Road are suddenly becoming relatively interesting species wise um, within a small area, i.e. from where I'm stood to that first bush, um, I managed to record 60 species. So it's quite an exciting uh, change and hopefully um, Wigan will reduce their cutting. They're looking at how they can reduce the cutting on the roadside verges, especially the trunk roads, which will 
again help wildlife and species move through the landscape so um quite an exciting um piece of other work that we've been involved in with with our partners in the sort of industrial and um semi-urban environment and the other thing that we've been doing is because we can't go very far it's encouraged me to start looking at um things that i might not have looked at so dandelions um and on the basis of the of this in the sudden new let's learn how to identify dandelions because they're there um we found in the car park of the wigan lwt office a first for lancashire um growing in the concrete um so that's uh, quite a interesting thing and it shows once you start looking around at things that you perhaps wouldn't have done before because you know going off to the lake district or whatever to look at rare orchids was a good thing to do looking at dandelions growing in your allotments and the car park at the office um can show what else is there and we've got a female orange tip there on on a on a dandelion um i um so it's all all quite exciting and 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 showing what biodiversity is in these areas and again just appreciating those wonderful things that are on our doorstep so hearts tongue fern um growing at the wigan flashes and um golden scaled male fern there so it's i think you know it's a I've, what i've sort of learned from this is just appreciating the sort of natural beauty of things that are around and watching nature change on the doorstep and royal fern again growing in wigan um, um as a remnant population on one of the mosslands uh so um kind of good local species and plants and things um and they're all part of our sort of conservation and biodiversity message and we've we've been out you know making sure that we've recorded them and so on when we can within our exercise periods and things uh, and something else that uh, we've done is great crested new ponds as part of the new district licensing so there's a great crested new pond that's literally gone in um at the beginning of the lockdown period when it it was okay to do this on as it was um construction work so it was district licensing work um approved by defra for us to continue so that was uh we've and we've created eight uh new great crested new ponds at ambers wouldn't a similar number at Pickershaw. so that's a quite a lot of of again conservation benefit under that scheme and we've got a got a loop annoying how did that happen there we go um and also part of uh our work has been this year um into last has been slow the flow projects in wigan this being one of them where we have tried to put rivers and channels back into the landscape as opposed to sending them down concrete uh, cultivated pipes and the like so um again opportunities for wildlife and this one has benefited things like willow tip because they've moved into the wet scrub adjacent because the water tables come up uh, grasshopper warbler there are now 12 pairs within the area of this scheme uh, so there's been noticeable improvements water bowls using the river great uh, crested newts using some of the side pools so it's all all in all lots of benefits uh, to wildlife as well as um, some benefits to the local communities. I've got two videos um, if anybody wants to have a look at them, um, which are on YouTube. And we can look at those later, I think, Mark, if that's okay with you. 
Yeah, they're, they're there. I've checked that they work this morning. The links work. Yeah. Right. Now, all I've got to be working is where to get back out of here. End show. Otherwise, I close. So, and if you just press your little button over there to stop sharing, that's excellent. Um, where, which one? Which one to stop sharing? Well, oh, sharing this episode. Stop sharing. I found the little button. Yeah, and I'm back now. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, if you just press on your little chat button, um, uh, sorry, on the uh, the yeah. attendees button. Uh, one of the things that we've uh, developed uh, through our teaching is a little way of uh, showing our appreciation for our guests, and I'd invite everybody to just raise their hand. Uh, just as a, an acknowledgement to that excellent talk to Mark. So I think, Mark, you can see there that uh, what you've gone through was uh, very much appreciated by everybody. So thank you very much indeed, Mark. And I hope that you'll stay with us for the, the rest of what we're going to go and uh, Mark says thank you to everybody so that's that's good um, moving on uh, Greg I'm hoping that you will share with us some of your moth photographs uh, just whilst you get that ready um, just whilst we get that ready uh, Mark, uh, Greg I'll just go through a couple of my slides can I just check with you Greg that that is okay for you to share some of your photographs if you just say something please uh, yeah that's fine super thank you so whilst you get that ready um these are a couple that i got at the weekend um this is a chocolate tip um it turned out to be a female chocolate tip because whilst i've got it uh, it uh, laid some eggs so i know it was a female and i like the, the coloration here the photograph doesn't do it justice and the the banding uh, i didn't take a picture of the head but it's one of these that doesn't really look as if it's got a head um oh that's uh, crept in the way uh sallow kitten uh, i'm finding a couple of these sallow kittens uh, but uh, my book tells me that they're not normally found this far north uh, but i found a couple of them um, recently and they're much uh, the contrast black and white is much greater than the um uh, the older kitten which is the only other one that seems to be in the book that's similar to that uh, the pale tussock and i have today caught both the male and the female pale tussocks um, and i've also picked up my first older moth and i'm hoping that greg that's giving you time to uh, pick up some of your uh, stuff i'll stop sharing my screen allow you to come in and to share your screen and uh, whilst that was going on there were some comments um, about uh, Mark's uh, work uh, saying thank you and could you uh, post the YouTube links in the chat if you're able to do that Mark that would be good just copy them and post them in the bottom there and uh, Danny has got some willow tits uh, that I'd recommend other than going to use the sickness of black night. Yes, and uh, some information about identifying them. Um, uh, Mark, you might want to declare that uh, your PhD was partly on willow tit and partly on um, um, uh, orchids, I believe. Yeah, right, so. Yes. <laughs> right, so Greg, are you yep. with us there, please? I can share. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've had a few different moth sightings um, this past week. Um, if you press the bit at the bottom there that says hide, then that yeah. that will just get rid of that banner. Thank you. So uh, I went to my local spot on the hill. I had my first burnet moths of the year uh, flying around, and suddenly there's been like an explosion. Um, they're everywhere, and a chimney sweeper which uh, didn't let me get very close. So this is the best I could do. It kept flying off. Um, but they're out now as well. And um, a mother Shipton uh, was also flying around. And I, I only learned about a couple of days ago that they were called that because of the outline sort of, of a witch's face on the wing. 
um, like the mother ships and sort of folklore character. Um, so that was quite a nice spot to see. Um, and then in the trap, I've had a few different moths. This is a coronet, um, which didn't go in the trap, but I usually go out sort of part way through the night because often things land on my conservatory sort of uh, wall. Keep going. Uh, uh, and then I had a white ermine and buff ermine as well um, this past few days. There's been quite a lot of ermines. Um, uh, light emeralds again landed on the um, uh, <laughs> I think the uh, outside the trap. Um, again, it, they never go in, but I always seem to get. I had about two, I think, that night, flying and sort of just settle quite close to the trap. Um, just to see, that was like sort of first for the year. Uh, more white ermines and then some buff ermines. Oh, which, that's nice. Yeah, this one was really spotty. Um, I've, I've never quite seen one that was quite so marked before, but yeah. Yeah. Um, then a small, uh, small wave number, which is so another geometry. Uh, this one is the only one I had. Um, haven't seen it since. Um, and then I had my first privet hawk moth of the year um, the other night. Um, and I've had quite a few uh, in the past few days. I've had about uh, three or four um, in the trap. So they've, they've suddenly come out of nowhere. And I've had a, a Wayne Scott species as well, one of the first Wayne Scots. Um, another white ermine. Um, and this is a middle barred minor, I think, which um, I'm part of Gloucester Moth Group. I had to ask them for this and they said it was a middle barred, um, quite a small sort of diminutive moth. Um, and then I had a, a large elephant hawk moth, a uh, regular elephant hawk moth um, in the trap, um, which we usually get Quite a lot, quite a few around the area. I guess my plant, my garden's got some quite good plants for these guys, because I, I guess all the the privet and elephant moths come into the garden to sort of feed on them. Um, and then a, a shears as well. I think I think this is shears. Looking at the wing markings, um, quite distinctive. And then a a poplar hawk moth as well. The other night. Um, a male. This is the first sort of one I've had this year. Um, I've been waiting quite a while for them. Um, I get I get eyed as well. I haven't had lime yet, but hopefully I'll get get one soon. And uh, my first large yellow underwing of the year, um, which will well I'll give it about a month or so, and that'll be the main moth in the trap, uh, and everything else will be kicked out. Um, a small magpie moth, and um, iron prominent. Which is not again one I don't get often in the trap. Um, had I think one last year, so I definitely kept this one for some photo opportunities. I've had a um, couple of those this year. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's the two uh, mega moths in the trap and the other night, uh, both the privet and the poplar. Um, and then uh, last night I went out and I uh, found this, which is a small elephant hawk moth. Um, and I had two in the trap this morning, so I'd been waiting for them. I expected them first before the large elephant hawk moth, but um, no, the, 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 these were later than the, the elephant this year, um, weirdly. Um, and then another another privet was also flying around the garden. Um, <laughs> and sort of, uh, well, I, 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 I first heard it, um, I just heard this sort of slamming noise and this huge moth was just flying all over the gravel in the garden and sort of crashing into everything. It was it was quite unusual. Um, and then a, a willow beauty. I think I think this is a willow beauty or mossed willow or something. I can't remember. I need to identify these. I've got two that I need to identify from this morning. Um, this one as well. It might be some sort of minor or something. Um, it was quite small. Um, and then this one, I, I need to work out. It didn't come any closer. It was just on the top of my observatory last night uh, sorry conservatory last night about half one in the morning so i didn't uh didn't work out but i think the most interesting moth sighting i've had this this uh this week if i can find it uh is actually 
this, which is an emperor moth that was flying around me um, a couple of afternoons. And it, unfortunately, it didn't settle at all. So this is the only sort of footage I got of it. But <laughs> There was one there, it was in shot. Yeah, uh, if I slowly pan the camera, I think it does do a very, very close fly past. There we go. There, there there's the is. emperor moth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take your word for it from that photograph yeah um but yeah and then um yesterday I, I put one up in the garden and um there was a moth emperor moth flying around my head so that was the first time it worked in my garden um so yeah at the end there's another video of the emperor moth you can see um it flies almost into the camera it kept flying into my trousers for some reason i don't know why um Maybe the pheromone I managed to get on there. Um, and this is a wood tiger, which is also quite common on my local site. Um, on the hill, um, I, go, I go up early evening and you can see hundreds of them flying around, but they're almost impossible to follow track with your eye across the uh, the landscape. You just have to sort of be lucky and find one sort of perched and then try and sneak up on it to get a photo because they fly off if you get too close. Um, yeah, that, that's all my moth sightings anyway. I've got Good. some butterflies Excellent. as well. But yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to share my uh, moth sightings with you on, on that day other than the ones that I've done already because I think that's a fantastic uh, collection of moths that you've got there. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg, for <laughs> sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to move on to our next little bit. Um, which is to think about things that we might have missed and I think what would be really useful here is if there was somebody uh, perhaps a, a local uh, chair of uh, the trustees of a wildlife trust who could say something about uh, 30 days wild I don't know if we have uh, amongst us uh, such a person who's able to say anything about that Steve Yes, certainly. I think you're referring to me. <laughs> I was indeed. It started, it's, we've been running this for a number of years now from uh, through the month of June. And it's, um, it's very much a sign up and get stuck in and get involved type of project. And um, I've not actually looked at the number who've signed up at the minute. 84,335. Right, well, our record total so far in previous years was 79,000. So, so we've got that. And it doesn't start till next Monday. So there's quite a few more days to sign up now. The whole point about this is getting people connected with wildlife. And um, there's no rules to it. It's just every single day through June, you do something wild. And it doesn't, I keep saying to people, you know, it doesn't involve east african safaris and finding rare birds it can be just looking at bees on your flowers in the garden or watching the birds on the bird table but it's just getting you to think of something every single day of june that's wild connecting yourself with with wildlife and of course people use social media to show what they're doing which is fantastic you see all these pictures from people all around the country uh, and abroad who uh, get involved and show everybody little snippets of their engagement with local wildlife. Um, I, I do it every year. It's, it, it gives you a, an incentive to really think about something every day and go out and do it. And this year is going to be even more interesting because people are going to have to do it in a much smaller area than in the past. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of our most successful things. Interestingly, it also pulls in uh, people that aren't wildlife trust members more, more, the majority of people who sign up for it are not wildlife trust members. So it's again, one of our biggest things for engaging with people who are not our normal crowd, you know, they're not our normal members. So fantastic. If any of you haven't signed up to it yet, you know what to do when you finish this video conference. <laughs> the, the link that I've got um, there takes you through to uh, this particular site. And as I was looking through it, people could see that there's the, the sign up there as well. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, the um, that didn't share in the way that it should have done. Try it again. 
Hmm. I'm having the same problem that you had before, uh, Mark. And that it's not, it's decided not to share with me. Uh, the, the next thing that we were going to look at, ah, oh, there it goes, it's took it, took its time. Uh, talking about looking at the, the local area and what we might find. Uh, I had a little explore um, over the last um, few days. Uh, I'm glad I did go out over the last few days because I had my early morning walk and the sites that you're about to see in this video don't exist anymore uh, because they've been mown. The carrot family comprises over 3,700 species, four of which can be found in the lanes near where I live. The hedgerows seem to be swathed in lace, Queen's Anne lace to be precise, the other name for cow parsley. Look carefully at the stems, there are no blotches. If there were, it would be hemlock, a highly poisonous plant. The leaves are finely divided, the stems are hollow, and at the top there is a flattened flower head. The petals are of various sizes, the flowers are highly aromatic, and there is a scent of aniseed in the air. Some of the petals have already fallen, leaving the urn-shaped seed pods. Although it may seem that there is only Queen Anne's lace in these hedgerows, a closer inspection reveals the broader leaves of hogweed. Until recently, this was a plant harvested to be fed to pigs, hence its name, and the young leaves are considered to be a delicacy for humans with a taste, I'm told, something of asparagus. The flowers are have petals of various sizes, but a rather unpleasant odour. The detail, however, of these flowers is exquisite, as we see the anthers and the petals. A little further on still, and hidden amongst the cow parsley, is wild angelica, a lime green plant at this time of the year, with the flowers just emerging. It is a highly aromatic plant, which is said to have a warm and ar aromatic taste and a very agreeable smell. The final of our four carrots is found near the remains of an oak tree, a small cluster of pig nuts, a plant that was once used as a food. It's the tuber, the underground tuber, uh, that is important, and pigs were used to uh, root them out, hence its name. The flowers bear close observation exquisite detail uh, to end our walk and to have discovered four carrots within 400 metres of my front door. Uh, an internal and inside broadcast of the tadpoles and I've kept my eye on them and the tadpoles haven't um, behaved during this session in the way that I'd hoped they would have done uh, but I was able to make a very brief film of this behaviour.
Robert, if you'd like to open your microphone and just say a few words. Um, yeah, um, I'm here. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it is feeling here uh, to, to, to just say it in one sentence. It's it's the I think the ecological term for it is now stone. So it's this this thin layer between aquatic and 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 um, terrestrial environments above it, and it's layers of of bacteria and, and protozoans and so on that they feed on. Sometimes they also breathe um, um, through through um, upper surface areas where the oxygen is a bit higher, but this is feeding behavior. There are um, tadpoles, um, not in the UK, but tropical ones that are particularly specialized in, in feeding on, on surface areas of ponds. Um, they have particular morphological adaptations and things like this as well. But is it just I think the, thing, the thing that I found interesting about that, uh, uh, Robert, is that they're feeding upside down that you can clearly see because of the markings on the uh, the underside that come up onto the surface and they, they graze, they come up and they, they turn upside down and they graze along the bot uh, along the surface and then flip over and go back down again. Which is what some insects do as well. There, there are some some aquatic um, insects as well that are basically leading upside down life for yes. for a range of reasons in ponds. Yes, and and I have that happening just a few uh, inches uh, from uh, from my camera, which is it's wonderful. So moving on, uh, the answer to the question. Well, it it was um, it was too easy. It was too easy for some of you. Um, a little bit of a, an exploded view there. And when I flip them over and show you um, what it actually was, yes, uh, you were right. Those of you that thought that it was the elephant hawk moth, absolutely right on that. And um, next week, uh, we're going to meet, I believe, uh, Danny on the 4th of June at 10 o'clock. Do you want to say a few words, Danny? Yep, yep, sure. Uh, yep, so I've got a confirmed speaker for next Thursday. Um, she's a freelance ornithologist called Dan Rouse, and she's worked with many of the wildlife trusts and RSPB and bird guides and things like that. So, a very um, bird focused guest talk coming up next Thursday. But yeah, very similar format to today. So, hopefully, you guys will be able to make it. So with that, I'd just like to say uh, thank you uh, to, to Mark, who was our guest speaker today, as this was the, the first uh, time that we've run through something like this. I pulled it together and, uh, and hopefully we'll work with Danny and with others of you as we pull uh, some more of this together over the uh, future weeks. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and hope to see you at our next Sea Nature.